Ladies and gentlemen, we live in interesting financial times. In 2008, it became clear that our financial system isn't as robust as many people thought. In response to this credit crisis, President Obama launched a 700 billion stimulus program. A global financial meltdown was narrowly averted. Turns out this stimulus program wasn't nearly enough. And by December 2011, the US Federal Reserve alone bailed out or insured banks to the tune of $30 trillion. That's about $250,000 per US household. And the same is happening in Europe, here in the UK, in Japan, and in many other countries. And it's not just the banks that cause trouble, it seems. In October of 2011, brokerage firm MF Global went bankrupt after a bet on Greek debt turned sour. Many of their clients today still fear never seeing back their assets because they had been used as collateral for the Greek gamble and for many other gambles like it. Actually, there is serious evidence that the practice of using customers' financial assets as collateral to trade in the markets, in other words, the practice of misappropriating client assets, is widespread among large brokers. And what to think of the recent LIBOR scandal? This scandal made headlines during the summer of 2012 when it became public knowledge that the benchmark interest rates for more than $400 trillion worth of financial contracts, including your mortgage agreements, have been manipulated for over two decades. <clears throat> Not that these interest rates, you know, the rates that govern uh, borrowing and spending around the world, not that these rates are natural anyway. For the past 100 years, interest rates have been set or manipulated, if you will, by central banks, making money cheaper than ever before and creating by now a very cruel no-win situation for savers around the world who are struggling to find something, anything, to, that will help them protect against the rising inflation. In their efforts to prevent the financial system from going under, Western governments have pushed up public debt levels to over 100% debt to GDP, which by any historical standard is completely unsustainable. And so, a different course is now being chosen. Instead of bailouts, the new trend in monetary policy is that of the bail-in. Basically, bail-in is the Cyprus solution. Instead of taking money from the taxpayer, the government takes money from the saver to allow for an orderly resolution of the bank. So in summary, we are seeing structural insolvency in both banks and governments. We're seeing a monumental debt bubble. We're seeing shaky brokerage firms, manipulated interest rates, rampant money printing around the world, and a solution to the problem that isn't a solution at all. Nowhere to hide is truly becoming the expression of our day and age. So how is all of this going to play out? I don't know exactly, and um, frankly, I don't care all that much because I own bitcoins. You see, bitcoin is not just another fragile virtual currency. It is a global and decentralized hard money ledger, which has all the qualities of becoming the foundation for a new financial paradigm. And that's incredibly exciting to me because whatever financial out service out there that we think should be improved Today with Bitcoin, it can be. <clears throat> the basis is there because Bitcoin as a currency possesses all the features that make for an ideal money. First of all, it is scarce. There will never be more than 21 million Bitcoins. It is also secure. It cannot be counterfeited or multiplied at will. And it allows for as much privacy as the user desires. Bitcoin is also extremely transportable. You can send it virtually instantaneous, essentially for free to anywhere in the world. Bitcoin is also amazingly flexible. Every single Bitcoin can be subdivided into millions of smaller parts and all Bitcoins are interchangeable. Furthermore, Bitcoin is extremely durable. The Bitcoins in your wallet will disappear only after every single copy of the blockchain has been erased. And remember the QT client alone has been downloaded already over 3 million times. And finally, and maybe most importantly, 
Unlike that of fiat currencies, the supply of Bitcoin is steady and predictable. All these features make Bitcoin a downright exceptional currency, which is why we will see adaptation continue uh, in a parabolic fashion. But that is just the beginning. The properties of Bitcoin allow it to become the first layer, the ground floor, if you will, of a new financial system altogether. And here is why. First of all, the Bitcoin protocol is open source, allowing millions of brilliant programmers to build layers on top of it to make it more useful. Just like what happened with the internet's TCP IP protocol. Second, because it is a peer-to-peer -peer network, Bitcoin truly is accessible from anywhere in the world. It doesn't care about arbitrary boundaries. It doesn't care about capital controls. It doesn't care about censorship or embargoes. Anyone in the world that can reach the internet directly or indirectly can pay and be paid with Bitcoin. This allows for the development of truly global financial solutions. Thirdly, the Bitcoin network is software based. So in theory, any mobile device can become a device for Bitcoin banking. Number four, Bitcoin is a pseudonymous network, which means that each participant can, can basically choose his or her own identity. We're seeing pseudonymous Bitcoin companies pop up already, daring initiatives that assist the network in clearing transactions and exchanging property and information, and of course, in, in trading goods back and forth across the world. And why is this pseudonymity so important, you ask? Well, because it removes the fear to innovate in a context of over-regulation. And that allows the Bitcoin network to become more sophisticated and accessible at a very rapid pace. And this then clears the way for more conventional, official businesses that make Bitcoin really appealing and accessible to the mainstream. All these characteristics together are telling us Bitcoin and the cryptocurrencies are here to stay and they are the future of finance. And I'm not the only one saying this, let alone the first one. In fact, the very title of this speech, which uh, you probably missed, but the very title of this speech is a slight alteration from a 1995 quote by the late Orlin Graby, in which he said, cryptology represents the future of privacy, and by implication, it also represents the future of money and the future of banking and finance. This was back in 95. In light of the recent NSA spying scandal, these words have, of course, only become more visionary. In case you haven't done so already, I really recommend you to read up a little bit about what's happening in the Bitcoin economy on a daily basis. This enormous potential for growth is attracting serious amounts of talent, knowledge, and capital from around the world. And of course, it should, because Bitcoin as a first-rate, pseudonymous, open source, and globally accessible money has everything it takes to compete in the $500 billion remittance market the $1,000 billion e-commerce market, the $7 trillion gold market, and also the $16 trillion offshore deposit market. And that's not all. Bitcoin even has the qualities to develop entirely new markets, such as bringing international banking to the 1 billion smartphone users and the 5 billion users of ordinary cell phones. Most of the latter don't even have a bank account, let alone have access to global markets. Bitcoin can change all of that and is doing so already. Furthermore, Bitcoin can get the promising market of micro loans and micro payments off the ground, a market which is currently underdeveloped because of the systemic financial bureaucracy that makes everything so slow and so expensive. And finally, because they can be used as a platform for the very cheap, efficient and secure transfer of property titles, Bitcoin and the cryptocurrencies even have the potential to revolutionize the accessibility and efficiency of stock markets, bond markets, derivatives markets, even real estate markets on a global level. The famous futurist and inventor Buckminster Fuller is quoted as saying, in order to change an existing paradigm, you do not struggle to try and change the problematic model. You create a new model and you make the old one obsolete. The entrepreneurs behind Bitcoin and the cryptocurrencies are building exactly that, a new paradigm for finance. And I'm thrilled to be able to sit on the tip of the spear, which is where we are today with this conference. Thanks very much.